so very good afternoon to all the participants all right so let's start uh, so i am ca navin vadwa from texmen i welcome you all in today's webinar on consideration in m and a deals in this webinar the speaker will explain the issues arising due to contingent consideration in m and a deal and the expectation from the upcoming budget so i request you to join us in welcoming our two learned speakers uh, mr anil talreja and mrs deepa dalal anil is a partner with deloitte and he has over 29 years of experience in handling matters pertaining to indian tax m and a and regulatory he also specializes in group restructuring involving merger demergers spin off and post merger integration and cross border acquisition a very warm welcome for you mr anil talreja thank you and good afternoon and our second speaker is deepa dalal she is a subject matter expert she has 20 21 years of extensive experience in advising clients in the areas of acquisition divestment tax structuring advisory her involvement has been across various industries including chemical media pharma telecommunication and includes both domestic and cross border transaction welcome deepa thank you navin good afternoon everyone so before i hand over the session to the speakers a few instructions for the participants your mic shall be on mute you will not be able to communicate during the session however you can post your questions in the chat box given your on your right hand side all your questions will be answered by the speaker after the session and you can also access this webinar on the youtube channel of taxman so i'll not take your much time and i request mr anil to start with your presentation over to you anil thank you uh, uh, mr navin and uh, good afternoon everyone hope everyone is doing well and staying safe uh, we've all adjusted and adopted to the virtual way of uh, providing uh, you know our views and insights and sharing our experiences so this is one of them uh today uh, as uh, as you know we are going to be discussing uh, a very interesting topic which is uh, the tax considerations uh, with specific reference to contingent considerations that we are witnessing in m&a transactions uh, we have a few slides uh, so uh, i'll request uh, uh, the team to uh, put that up uh, but as that happens i think uh, Uh, in the past couple of years all of us have learned to live with uncertainty i'm sure you will agree you don't know what is going to happen the very next week or the very next month or in fact the very next day with specific reference to uh, uh you know restrictions lockdown the pandemic uh, but uh, at the end of it it has also taught us uh, a lot in terms of adapting to change in a more Uh, a smooth manner when you talk about living in uncertainty uh, there is this aspect of contingent consideration which also has a reasonable amount of uncertainty in today's times when you look at mna deals so what is contingent consideration uh, we've seen that uh, when when the deal makers are sitting into the deal room and trying to negotiate uh, a transaction whether it is an acquisition or a slum sale or an asset sale they are always sort of uh, uh witnessing a level of uncertainty even in the transaction uh it's a different thing that the uncertainty levels in an mna deal have reached a different sort of uh, bar at this point in time but there is always that fear in their heart that uh whether the price that is being paid by the buyer is that the right price whether the company the way uh, the diligence has been conducted whether the company will not have any surprises or any uh, time bombs uh, in the future with specific reference to you know any exposures so uh, in in those situations uh there was always commercial conversations on can we have part of the consideration to be contingent contingent as in contingent on happening 
or not happening of a particular event. Uh, we can go to the next slide and you will see uh, what is a unique nature of, con of contingent consideration. Uh, just before that, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to walk you through with some basic concepts with practical instances of contingent consideration. We will also discuss tax considerations in the hands of the seller, uh, buyer. What are the burning issues? And most importantly, what we expect in the, um, in the upcoming budget, uh, which is uh, due next week. Let's dive into some more intricacies of contingent consideration and what does it really mean? So as I was explaining, uh, contingent consideration is where the parties lock horns, agree to a transaction, but they try and bring about contingency in the price that is going to be paid. Now, from a commercial aspect, it really looks smart. It looks cute to ensure that there is some amount of insurance, so to say, against the price which is being paid. Because in case the company doesn't perform the way it is anticipated, they can actually pull some part of the consideration depending on the commercial agreement. And uh, uh, the amount which is due subsequently is uh, can be adjusted. So in simple terms, contingent consideration is where you agree a price and you also agree a formula. So today when you do the acquisition, you pay a price, which is a fixed price. You also have an upside or an additional amount to be paid or not to be paid depending on happening or not happening of a particular event. That element is contingent, which could be based on time, which could be based on productivity. It also could be based on certain events. So I was working on a transaction, for example, where uh, a US company was doing an acquisition of a chemicals uh, factory and business in India. Uh, they, have, they, they, they did their commercial, financial, tax, accounting, diligence, uh, legal as well. Uh, but they were not very sure of how the company would perform or the factory would work, the productivity going forward. So the way they went about it is they had a fixed consideration, which they uh, paid to acquire the company. Uh, and there was also a contingent consideration, which was to be paid a, depending on the productivity level of the plant. So if the plant would have achieved a particular level of threshold productivity certified by, say, a third party, an independent party, then they would pay the balance amount, which would be contingent consideration. Now, in case that doesn't happen, then obviously there will not be any need for them to pay that amount. So that I think appears to be a very good solution in the current uncertain times where we really don't know what is going to be the market. Uh, there are several other additional features. There's competition, there is uh, uh, regulations, there could be pollution control boards, uh, you know, uh, being, being uh, looked at a company where there is enough pollution being generated. So these parameters can be built in. So from a transaction perspective, it comes up as a very smart solution and it gives comfort to the buyer and the seller. However, what happens in tax is, is what we should uh, discuss because I think uh, we can't ignore tax implications arising of uh, these considerations. The fundamental of tax has always been that insofar as capital gains is concerned, uh, capital gains would accrue or arise when a transfer takes place. And we will, we will discuss a bit more in detail in the next few slides. But the important aspect is what is the timing of the transfer? What is the timing of taxation of the transfer? So as you see on the slide, one additional aspect I'd like to mention, there is a difference between contingent consideration and deferred consideration. As the name indicates, deferred consideration is where the amount is fixed. You're only deferring the payment. Whereas in contingent consideration, the whole consideration or part of the consideration itself is contingent. So whether it will be paid or not is itself a question mark. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide uh, and maybe just touching upon certain other aspects before we dive deep dive into uh, the tax parts. So if you look at uh, uh, the various modes of discharging consideration today, uh, earnouts, special bonus, payment in kind, these are very, very common. And these are uh, you know uh, pretty much used in practical transactions. In fact, earnout is something that uh, typically would also be enabling the deal makers or acquirers to ensure that the senior executives 
of companies uh, continue to uh, you know be with the uh, company so that you know after the acquisition happens you don't have uh, outburst of uh, you know your key employees which may again uh, leave the company in turbulence so just like how earnouts is i think contingent consideration also plays an important role uh, from a commercial standpoint uh, because it also appears to be quite efficient from a cost perspective because if you go to an escrow or a or a hold back or a guarantee there are restrictions as well as it's slightly cost prohibitive so let's deep dive into what could be part of the the contingent consideration and what could more particularly be the tax aspects of contingent consideration uh, maybe i'll request uh, uh, my colleague uh, deepa to maybe share some of her thoughts and and tax implications arising out of this interesting aspect of an mna deal deepa thank you anil so uh, as anil mentioned we will deep dive into uh, this piece where uh, we look at what are the implications of a contingent consideration in the hands of uh, seller buyer and uh, what are the issues so firstly from a seller standpoint uh, there are different uh, scenarios which we have tapped or which we have come across as we look at uh, you know how this consideration could be taxed and one school of thought is that uh, this should be taxed in the year of transfer so straight deep diving here as to what all are the uh, key points or arguments uh, in the favor of this view of course it's the most conservative view so as to say and uh, this also is uh, is the is the least risky option from a tax perspective if one was to say so we are saying here that uh, no matter what is to be received later uh, the entire consideration including the contingent piece should be taxed in the year of transfer and uh, why do we say so uh, one is that uh, the charging section which is section 45 uh the language says that uh you know the gain shall be deemed to be the income of the previous year in which the transfer take takes place so uh here because the transfer of the asset that is for example shares or business is taking place in the year, in the first uh year where you are actually receiving uh, uh the first part of the consideration uh this should be subject to tax in that year also uh the computation mechanism says uh, that a uh, full value of consideration received or accrued should be subjected to tax and we'll come to this piece about accrued uh, i think there are various interpretations here uh but simplistically say saying here full value of consideration should be subjected to tax and therefore uh, uh to read it liberally in favor of taxing it in year 1 is one view uh also uh, you know a uh, one more point uh, supporting the argument is uh, wherever uh, you know there was an intention of law to tax it in the year of receipt those are specifically spelled out in law uh and uh, example insurance compensation or compensation from government etc those are uh, you know to be taxed in the year of receipt otherwise accrual basis everything should be subject to tax also um in this favor there are some judicial precedents and uh, as as usual uh, as you expect in india on any issue we have lot of judicial precedents on on various uh, uh scenarios or viewpoints as i may say so uh, uh here we have a uh, delhi high court in the case of ajay gulia which supports this view as well as uh, mrs indra shetty from mumbai itat holds the same view that this should be uh, subject to tax in year 1 itself 
so this is uh, one scenario uh, uh, where we are saying it should be subject to tax in the year of transfer and we should just see how this looks like if one was to put an example um, and and uh, what are the key issues here so uh, basically when when we are looking at uh, taxing it in year 1 the question which arises is that uh, if you have contingency basis future events how will you uh, determine uh, whether you know those events will occur or will not occur and it is it is just uh, by going by a one sided approach that you would think that uh, whether or not the event happens this amount will accrue to me uh, one more issue which we have come across is uh, if Uh, there is a part which is contingent whether you should include it when you are testing uh, for applicability of minimum consideration to be uh, received as per 50d or 50b uh, so there are various sections which prescribe that from a tax standpoint there is a minimum fmv which a seller should get and whether those need to be applied uh including the contingent consideration and uh, what if uh, that is not received so in this view because you are taxing everything up front it would be simpler to compare the fmv because you are taking a view that you are taxing everything up front so here it is it is a simpler uh, exercise to do that you would have compare the fmv with the total consideration and uh, also uh, you know here uh, the the chances of litigation uh, could be lesser because uh, you are actually offering the full amount to tax and therefore uh, there is no question of uh, you offering lesser and litigation is is not there in this approach uh, but what happens if things do not go as as were planned from a seller standpoint and the seller does not receive the full amount so we have seen this happening quite a lot that at times uh, you know the events do not uh, happen as they were promised certain debtors which are contingent were not fully recovered or certain events which were supposed to happen have not happened in this case of course the seller has offered everything up front but that is not fair because uh, you have received lesser so can you claim a loss later on and uh, it could get complicated if uh, the revised return timeline has lapsed and uh, what would be the loss be under the head so basically this is a uh, again uh, relating to the same asset transfer and therefore uh, you know a view could be that you will have to revise your return and amend your gain in order to claim uh, a reduction in your capital gain and uh, uh, that could be one view the other view could be that irrespective because on the principles of uh, justice that uh, you have already offered this even if you are unable to revise your return can you claim it separately as a capital loss so uh, when you take this view and tax it in year 1 it may get difficult for you to claim a loss in the next uh, in the future years because uh, the the transaction has already happened and if the timeline for revision of return has gone by uh then it would be uh, a weaker claim and and you would really have to fight with department to give you this uh loss or reduction in in capital gain so as to say so here we have uh, actually uh, demonstrated this by way of an example where you have the year of transfer as 21 22 fi and uh, the total amount of fixed consideration for example is 100 and additionally there is an amount of contingent consideration of 20 and this is supposed to be determined in 25 26 so there is a significant gap of time and uh, here 
going by this view or scenario, you are actually offering uh, 120 in 21, 22 entirely, whether you receive or not. Uh, and then, of course, you will wait. And in 25, 26, now you have one scenario where you have not received anything as contingent consideration that event has not happened and therefore you're receiving nothing and uh, if you receive nothing the question which we discussed whether you can claim a loss or revise your return of course the return revision timeline has gone by for this and therefore uh, for example in this case assessment also may have happened Therefore, uh, you know, your only chance is to claim it separately as a capital loss. Uh, as opposed to that, if you have actually received the full amount, uh, then you do not need to think about anything. You have already offered that amount for tax. So this is one scenario where uh, we have seen this uh, view being taken uh, on uh, by, by certain uh, people. There is, uh, there are alternate views as we discussed. Now, in this scenario, uh, this is 1A, which is a slight modification uh, to 1. And what is the difference? Let us take you through that. Uh, here, there is a tweak in the way you are uh, looking at this whole contingent consideration. Firstly, uh, the contingent consideration is uh, regarded as a, a right to receive uh, a consideration in future and it is regarded as a separate capital asset and uh, what happens is uh, up front you will estimate so if if i if i could take you through the example and i'll cover the points about if you see uh, again the year of transfer is 21 22 the fixed consideration is 100. Uh, the contingent consideration also here is 20. However, there is an estimated value of contingent consideration which you have uh, parked, which is say uh, 16. So you have uh, analyzed as a, as a seller that what are the possibilities of me receiving this amount and how much can I receive? Uh, and this usually happens uh, when you look at NDS at times you estimate, uh, you know, what are the possibilities of an event happening. Uh, usually you would do that in case of, uh, say, convert preference shares, etc. In a similar way, you would estimate possibility of this event basis which contingent consideration is derived of happening and how much can you receive. So here you have estimated 16 to be received uh now what is happening is in the uh, in 21 22 you are not offering 120 but instead you are offering 116 the estimated amount of gains then what happens is uh, you go forward and you reach the year in which you are supposed to uh, get this contingent consideration which is 25 26 now at this time you realize that you are not receiving anything this event has not happened and you have not received anything now uh, what happens is because you have treated this as a right to receive consideration as a separate capital asset uh, this asset is now transferred and you have not received anything so there is a loss which has arisen for in your hands of 16 which you are claiming now here uh, because you are uh, regarding this as a separate capital asset and not really linking it to the first transfer of the uh, main capital asset therefore uh, your chances of claiming capital loss here are are brighter because you are not having to revise the return so in this scenario you would ideally uh, file a separate new return in this year and claim this as a loss of this year of 25 26. 
now uh, let's uh, look at a scenario where you are receiving actually 20 instead of 16 so you had estimated 16 as to be received but you are receiving more than that so there is an additional capital gain which arises which is 4 difference between 16 and 20 now this 4 uh, you know is a is is received in 25 26 now going by the similar theory because this is a capital asset which is a right to receive consideration you will offer it for tax in 25 26 however uh, one cannot rule out the possibility that tax office may uh, may disregard uh, this entire theory of regarding this as a separate capital asset and therefore whether there could be interest there could be penalty because this four if tax authorities say that belongs to the original asset then there could be uh, uh, a liability to pay this four uh, 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 tax on four in year uh, of the original transfer which is 21 22 however going by this theory you would argue that because this is a separate capital asset and when you transfer this capital asset which is in 25 26 because you have extinguished that asset to receive any further right and and uh, it's it's actually a, a transaction where you are extinguishing and therefore receiving four and on this theory therefore you would argue that this is a taxable gain only in 25 26 moving on uh, to another alternate scenario or a school of thought which says you have to tax in the year in which you actually receive the balance consideration because it accrues in that year itself so what are the arguments and what are the judicial precedents which support this view so uh, arguments are that uh, you know you cannot have a hypothetical income under section 5 and there is a lot of jurisprudence around it already uh, we have supreme court judgments which say that if uh, income has not accrued or arisen you will not be able to tax this and therefore it should fall out of the scope of uh, income and uh, then of course the charging sections and the computation mechanism does not apply so uh, here uh, there are also uh, judicial precedents one is in the case of a share transfer uh, which is uh, mr himal rajeshete and there is also um, another uh, case law which is universal medicare in case of a business transfer wherein the courts have held that um, if the consideration is contingent you never had a right to receive it for example if it has been kept in escrow and uh, you know uh, clearly stated out in the agreement that the purchase consideration is is limited to the upfront consideration and only to be revised if certain events happen and therefore a uh, basis these judicial precedents a clear view emerges that uh, uh, that a view the, the supporting this scenario that you could take a view that uh, in case of a clear contingent consideration the taxability should arise only when the consideration is accrued to you that is in the year in which uh, your accrual happens now let us look at uh, the example where clearly we have uh, uh, stated this so in this example again the uh, fixed consideration is 100 the contingent consideration is 20 and uh, in the first year where you have received 100 you have subject that 100 to tax then in 25 26 for example you receive nil because the contingency event has not gone in your favor then the capital loss will be nil or again also will be nil 
and uh, if in 25 26 you receive additional 20 you will subject that to tax in 25 26 however um, in this situation one cannot rule out uh, the litigation from tax office uh, that this should be subjected to tax in 21 22 because it relates to transfer of the original capital asset and therefore uh, there is there could be interest penalty etc so uh, this this scenario uh, you will take a view or the arguments that this never accrued and therefore there are no implications in the hands of the seller uh, beyond 100 so these are uh, some of the scenarios which uh, which is in in the in uh, for from a uh, seller standpoint there are certain other considerations which uh, which are uh, important and worth noticing that is uh, typical issues which arise is uh, if on a contingent consideration tax has been withheld then the refund uh, is is an issue and to claim a refund uh, on such a scenario it may take a huge amount of time and there are practical difficulties in claiming such a refund also uh, the timeline to revise returns are not in line with uh, the commercially agreed uh, uh, timelines for contingent consideration then there could be issues on account of revision of return etc and uh, of course like we discussed uh, the fair value uh, uh, minimum prescribed fair values whether uh, include contingent consideration or do not uh, that remains an open point and uh, if you are following an approach that contingent consideration should be subject to tax in the year in which you actually receive it then uh, this could pose a serious challenge uh, because then you would have a upfront differential tax if the fmv is higher as per income tax rules and then of course you will have a tax later on when the contingent consideration arises as well so these are some of the practical issues in the hands of the seller going uh, forward uh, moving forward to what are the considerations in the hands of buyer so the issues actually not only plague the seller uh, the issues actually impact the buyers as well um, and you would see how. So the question usually in the buyer's hands are, uh, one is whether um, you would get, uh, you can add the contingent consideration to your cost of acquisition or not. And sometimes it may have a, a bearing as to how the seller is treating, whether withholding is done or not, etc., etc. So, uh, the cost step up uh, is, is an important piece from a buyer standpoint. Uh, also, uh, you know, the withholding taxation, usually it's a point of negotiation between the buyer and seller because you are if you are advising uh, or if you are the, the buyer or advising the buyer, then you would be very cautious and you would say uh, that uh, if you are buying from a non-resident, then you should withhold up front on the full amount and not wait for the contingent consideration to materialize because i you know in as per indian law uh, the buyer could be uh, held responsible for the seller's taxes on on a, a purchase from a non-resident so uh, this is a typical negotiation point in case of a share sale on withhold tax compliance and therefore, uh, usually there is a lot of to and fro around it. And uh, because of the practical difficulties and, and the way the law is worded, uh, this, uh, this is uh, then mutually settled basis commercial decisions. Um, another issue is, uh, are there deemed income provisions because of uh, you know, the minimum prescribed uh, fair values? uh that get attracted in the hands of buyer and then what would be uh what would be uh the the issues surrounding it so those are also uh, a point of contention 
इन केस ऑफ अ स्लम सेल देर आर सम एडेड इशूज सो शेयर सेल ऑफकोर्स वी डिस्कस द इशूज बट इन केस ऑफ स्लम सेल uh what happens is because uh, you when when a buyer acquires a, a business on a slum sale basis the buyer usually allocates values in a ppa now um say for example like we discussed 100 is your upfront consideration and 20 is contingent then whether the buyer should do a ppa for 120 or for 100 and for example you do a ppa for 100 because you have paid only 100 and 20 is a unestablished liability uh then for that 20 when you actually make a payment for example in 25 26 in in our example year then um whether in that year you can reallocate consideration towards other assets and then whether you need a fresh ppa and whether from a tax standpoint you can uh, play with the uh, with the wdv blocks which are already there from a tax perspective because this is not um, this is not an improvement to the existing assets but it is ideally a payment for assets so uh, all of these points do arise uh, when you look at a ppa and complexities from a buyer standpoint from a tax amortization uh, perspective uh also uh, there is in in various case laws uh, this point is raised that uh, in a slum sale you need to have a lump sum consideration and because of uh, having a contingent consideration whether you are violating the definition of slum sale itself and whether you are risking your uh, business transfer as not being regarded one because the consideration is split in two parts so that 100 and 120 whether it causes uh, an issue from a uh, from a slum sale being regarded as such so these are some of the issues from a from a buyer standpoint uh anil any uh, any points to please uh, chime in uh, yeah okay. sure thanks uh, deepa so i think you know one thing that comes out of this uh, sort of uh, inputs is that there are a bunch of burning issues uh, there is lack of clarity on some of the provisions and maybe that is also causing Uh, a reasonable amount of resistance for deal makers to go ahead and sign up on deals because these amounts could be very large right uh, uh, one of the you know issues that i could see uh, clearly coming out of this and we've seen that in practical terms as you were explaining deepa is uh, you know filing the revised return because on the day of the transaction you perhaps don't have 100% certainty coming back to the point of certainty in which we live Uh, of what the consideration is but maybe uh, a year or two down the road you perhaps realize that this is the consideration and in a particular uh, situation you may have to revise returns now you know it becomes a little bit more complex as you go into the burning issues uh, because you have you have uh, judicial precedents which cause you know some some amount of additional complexity to the situation so for example the supreme court ruling in the case of goet india uh, clearly held that if there is a claim to be made by a taxpayer it has to be made in the revised return only and not by filing a letter with the assessing officer now the question that arises is that if the time limit to file the revised return is already gone and thereafter there is more clarity or visibility on the exact amount of consideration then does the supreme court ruling come in my way because it may cause issues uh with regard to getting the benefit in case the reduction uh, there is a reduction in the consideration that means i would have paid more tax by making an estimate in year 1 and then i am pretty much into a lock jam situation so maybe let's uh, discuss a bunch of uh, similar burning issues before we get to what we expect from the budget people Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, Anil. 
so uh, i guess uh, exactly the point that anil said that uh, we we do have uh, you know these issues which are there in the hands of uh, buyer and seller uh, that is all of these issues and some of them are peculiar to share transfer some of them are peculiar to business transfer uh, and and uh, on a contingent consideration you know uh, a uh, leaving aside the accounting and fema issues these issues uh, are are uh, huge enough to tackle and therefore we would expect uh, some clarity in law uh, because of uh, uh, because of you know impossibility at times to arrive at a uh, uh, amenable conclusion of dealing with this um, i mean like we have discussed uh, in in the hands of seller at times uh, you know there are various ways in which uh, one could structure it but you know those all of those ways which is uh, paying management fees or having a uh, paying bonus to individual sellers all of those have uh, you know different issues uh, from from seller perspective and therefore uh, i think a clarity on this uh, uh from on the uh, from uh, the the uh, from the government is needed and therefore uh, we have uh, put down what all are the uh, expectations from the budget yeah so i think uh, you know this is interesting because uh, this is a very uh, clear area where i believe there's more clarity that we need uh this is an area that i hope that the regulators are also looking at in terms of uh, you know uh, giving that sort of uh, you know provisions in the law or guidance from the law because it will also go a long way to ease out on mna transactions which also eventually will be a contributor to the ease of doing business in india so maybe uh, deepa if you could walk us through with some of the pointed questions that you may have from the finance minister when she lays out the budget sure so i think uh, if if i was to request the finmin uh, uh, that she clarifies uh, what could be the year of taxation and uh, to specifically say that in case of contingent consideration the the year of taxation should be actually when when this accrues and not merely when when this is set out in an agreement that could lead us to a certainty on the amount to be taxed therefore uh, the amount which should be taxed up front should be only uh, what is received and uh, what has accrued on that day and the amount which should be subject to tax later that uh, shouldn't have uh, interest or or penalty or such bits so that would aid uh, the deals uh the third and the most important thing is that the nature of that income should still be capital gains because moving it to bracket of business income or something like that uh, would also impair uh, you know the whole thought process of uh, of uh, having this as a contingent consideration uh, therefore should be taxed at the beneficial rate uh, of capital gain itself uh that also is is my ask and uh, a fourth point is also from a buyer standpoint clarity should be provided uh so not only the seller but for buyer as well that the withholding should arise only when this really accrues and uh, in a contingent consideration shouldn't accrue on day one and only when the contingency is resolved and in case of a slump sale lastly uh, you know the points uh, which we discussed there should be clarity that this uh, contingent consideration shouldn't impair slump sale as such and also uh, on the ppa the flexibility should be there to uh, later on allocate a consideration uh, so anil these would be my my request to finland yeah just one more additional point uh, on the flexibility and the ppa point that you mentioned uh, see we recognize that last year uh, the finance uh, minister had rolled out valuation norms for slum sale you know in terms of carrying out a slum sale and now if you were to go uh, look at the picture a little differently uh, 
you have a transaction where there is contingent consideration and it's a slum sale and there is also these valuation rules it just adds more complexity to this whole situation because the last thing the buyer and the seller would want is uh, getting trapped into uh, a net of tax uh, which may be on account of uh, you know consideration that they never received so sort of challenging the real income theory is something that perhaps uh, um, may ultimately be upheld by courts, but it's better to get clarity right up front before we go down the whole process of uh, litigation. Yeah. Right, so I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead, uh, Deepa. Yeah, I was just saying that's a valid point and uh, we need to kind of have clarity on these points. Correct. So that's what we thought, you know, this was a sort of a, a very focused uh, uh, area of concern by, uh, by many MA advisors, including us, which we faced in our transactions. There are a, a bunch of questions that have already come up. So what we can try and do in the next few minutes, uh, try and uh, I know some of the questions uh, did get answered as we moved along. But maybe uh, let me pick up a question uh, which says, uh, that what could be the cost of acquisition in the case of contingent consideration. I, I think that we did discuss that uh, cost of acquisition, again, is defined under Section 55, specific definition. Uh, and you may have also seen the amendment that was made last year uh, with specific reference to goodwill, where, you know, the, the, the theme announced by the government was that cost of acquisition can't be notional. It has to be actual cost incurred and hence you know, there is a possibility that the cost that you would take for that contingent element uh, could be nil. I mean, that, that that is something that perhaps you may have to factor as part of your business model when you are uh, planning a transaction. Uh, I think another question which is, if it is considered as a separate asset, then what will be the cost of acquisition? Uh, maybe Deepa, you can add here, but in my view, uh, any asset, if you consider, the cost will be the price that you have paid to acquire the asset. Uh, and hence, if you haven't really paid to acquire an asset, then the cost would, uh, I'm afraid, be nil. I mean, an example that comes to my mind is bonus shares. Uh, you know, although you have uh, an entitlement to bonus because you have original shares, but for tax purposes, the bonus shares cost uh, are deemed to be uh, nil. But yeah, if yeah. you can add something, please go ahead. That's right, Anil. So in our example, going back, we had considered, uh, you know, that asset uh, cost uh, of uh, basically the 16, which which was contingent there. Uh, we had treated it as a separate capital asset in, in our example. And uh, just going back. I'll just uh, flash it for the benefit of everyone. Yes. So here in this scenario, we had said that you can treat it as a uh, separate capital asset because you have uh, uh, you have said 16 is what you anticipate and you had offered to tax 16. 16 is what is becoming your uh, base of acquisition here because you have offered this to tax separately. And if you do not receive anything, you will uh, claim it as a loss. But if you have received something, then so uh, as, as Anil said, because you have paid tax on it, you will, if you have not done any, uh, not paid any cost, you will not get anything. But here you have paid tax and therefore you would regard it as a uh, 16 as the base. Yeah, I think uh, the same would apply, you know, when you when you have a cross border transaction. So the treaty benefits would you know apply in a similar way as uh, as we just uh, discussed, depending on uh, the residential status of the non resident. Maybe Deepa, one question you may want to throw a light on. What is the possibility of the contingent amount being characterized as income from other sources? in the year of uh, receipt, as in case of advance received and not repaid. Yes, so this uh, piece, like we discussed, uh, you know, uh, there is, if you if you 
uh, treat it separately and do not offer it for tax in the year in which the transaction happens, uh, there is a risk that uh, this could be regarded as uh, income from other sources uh, and tax office could say that, uh, uh, you know, this is not actually because there is no transfer of capital asset in this year. Uh, and that could be a point of contention. That is why uh, scenario two is, is litigious on this count as well. However, the argument there could be that if you have disclosed it in the year of transfer in your return, that uh, you will offer a contingent consideration if it arises owing to transfer of this asset as a capital gain owing to the transfer as a fresh accrual, uh, then probably you could take that argument. Anil, uh, if you would like to add. Yeah, I think and, and the same could apply for, uh, I think, business income. Uh, I do see a question on Section 11 exemption. Uh, obviously, a lot will depend on the core objects of the taxpayer trust uh, under Section 11. But uh, if it meets the objective, then, uh, you know, it, it can actually fall into an exemption. But coming back to the point on characterization, I think there is one uh, one of the asks from our from the finance minister is also to give clarity on uh, characterization of this uh, income. I mean, a very natural corollary will be to characterize this as capital gains because it emanates from transfer of uh, capital assets, i.e. shares or even business. But uh, having said that, I think uh, clarity on this count would rule out any unnecessary litigation. Uh, there's another set of questions, uh, uh, and I know we are sort of... Uh, heading towards the end of our session, but I'll pick up one question, uh, which is on GST. Now, uh, I think one important aspect we should always remember, uh, and that is a lot will, uh, a lot as in, uh, given that there is no clarity in law today, the position that the company's buyer or seller are going to take, a lot would depend on the documentation. How is the documentation going to be done for the contingent consideration? In the sense, you know, is it uh, 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 how is it going to be reflected in the share purchase agreement? What are the conditions for this contingent consideration? So the example that I had mentioned, which I was witness to when it was linked to productivity levels. So that documentation in the agreement becomes extremely, extremely important. Now, uh, that also would give clarity to uh, whether GST would be applicable to it or not. Now, GST typically would apply, uh, as you know, uh, uh, for goods and services. Uh, whether shares would fall within goods or services is a separate question by itself, uh, leaving aside contingent consideration. But having said all of that, I think, uh, you know, the applicability of GST would again determine or will, will, will stand on the plank whether transfer of shares can be subjected to GST or not. Because, I mean, with the, with the cloud of uncertainty on what is the tax treatment, I think the natural consequences, this is consideration that is being received pursuant to transfer of ownership of the shares. And hence, the same treatment should be applied. Now, a related aspect is, which uh, is also important, is applicability of TCS which is tax collection at source, which again is a very, very common phenomenon that we come up because again, TCS is linked to the consideration. What is the amount of consideration to be taken in the scenarios that we explain? So this is another uh, uh, issue that arises. There are many other pockets of the tax law which will get impacted as a result of this. And hence, uh, it's important that some direction or clarity is given by the finance minister uh, to uh, enable a uh, bunch of deals which are stuck for this reason to go through uh, uh, in the economy. Uh, Deepa, if you want to add something more, please feel free. Uh, but I'm afraid I think we are pretty much running out of time. Yes, nothing more from my side. Any. So uh, thanks, Anil, and thanks, Deepa. So I have one question, and uh, thereafter I would also like to read a note shared by my accounting team who is looking after the accounting module of taxman.com i'll read their note wherein they have uh, shared a detailed note how uh, the guidance is available in accounting standard and indian accounting standard 
on the treatment of contingent consideration. So before that, I'll just quickly ask my uh, question. So many users may have doubt on the applicability of BC Srinivasa Shetty's case in case of considered, uh, contingent consideration. So do you see any relevance of this case law in this context? Well, BC Srinivasa Shetty's case was more with regard to extinguishment of the right. So, uh, well, it may it is it is relevant. Uh, I, I I don't think we can say it is not going to be relevant. But having said that, I think uh, the relevance only is restricted to the extinguishment part, uh, and and that I think has been uh, applauded by various courts subsequently. But Deepa, please add. This is your experience. Yeah, I think uh, the cost of acquisition or being a self-generated asset, all of those things, uh, theory may not apply. Uh, and we are trying to actually go away from it and trying to say that you link it to the original asset transfer, but only uh, defer the timing of it. So that would be uh, that would be uh, the kind of uh, thing with our ask. Thanks, Ipa. Uh, so I'll not take much time. We are already exceeding the allocated time. So I'll quickly read a detailed uh, uh, note shared by the accounting team on the treatment of contingent consideration in m and as per AS and NDS. So the accounting treatment of contingent consideration for entities following AS is dealt by accounting standard 14 and NDS 103 is applicable for the entities following NDS. So uh, for uh, the uh, seller's perspective, um, uh, so for the buyer's perspective, uh, the an entity following the AS should qualify the contingent consideration as liability only if it meets the definition of liability as provided in ES 29. In any other case, the consideration should be classified as equity. So consider, uh, contingent consideration which is classified as liability should be included in the total purchase consideration only if it meets the condition prescribed by ES 14. Whereas for contingent consideration classified as equity, only one condition as prescribed by AS14 is required to be satisfied. So in both the cases, the effect of adding contingent consideration amount to the amount of purchase consideration goes to either goodwill or capital reserve as the case may be. And for the entities uh, complying with the NDS, uh, so in this case, uh, on the one, uh, one hand, the entity complying with NDS shall classify contingent consideration as liability only if it meets the definition of financial liability as provided in para 11 of India's 32. In any other case, the contingent consideration is classified as equity. So buyer shall recognize a contingent consideration liability or equity as and when it meets the respective definition of liability and equity as provided in, in AS 32. So it is valued at fair value in accordance with the guidance provided in India's 109 and India's 113. So on, on the uh, treatment of the contingent consideration in the seller's book, so there's no specific guidance is available for accounting of contingent consideration in the books of seller of a business under AS. However, the right to receive additional consideration in the form of money or any other asset can be recorded as receivable asset in the books if it's in flow to the seller is certain in accordance with in, uh, accounting standard 29. In India, the right to receive additional consideration in the form of money or any other financial asset or buyer's equity shares can be recorded as financial assets in the seller's book if it meets the definition of financial asset as provided in para 11 of India's 32. So that's all uh, from the accounting perspective. So if you face, if you have any issue relating to taxation or GST or accounting, you can drop us an email at sales at the rate and uh, so before uh, we sign off, I would request you to uh, check out the budget website of Taxman we have just launched. So you can go to taxman.com slash budget to get uh, all the updates relating to the budget. And join me in giving a vote of thanks to Anil and Deepa in uh, giving such a brilliant uh, presentation and to give a clarity on such uh, gray areas of taxation. So MND deals are not new concepts. So it has been uh, in the industry for so many years. But surprisingly, uh, I didn't find any webinar or any speaker speaking on the contingent consideration. 
Uh, thanks, Deepa, and thanks, Anil, for giving us a clarity on the concept. And uh, we hope that the finance minister also uh, listens to us and bring out the clarity in the taxation laws uh, to ensure any to, uh, to avoid any kind of litigation on the treatment of contingent consideration, both in the case of hands of buyer and the seller. So thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Any closing remark you want to make, Anil? And Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Bye -bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you.